The Black Sea coast is one of Russia's top tourist destinations. Sun, sea, and the best wine that the country has to offer. But if those weren't good enough reasons on their own to come here, there's also a little mystery that I want to get to the bottom of. I'd heard long ago that there was a man named Brown who'd come to Russia's Black Sea coast to grow grapes and make wine. He might not have been my ancestor, but a namesake in the Krasnodar region seemed a perfect excuse for a visit. I turned up one bottle of the family wine, but if there was another one out there, I was going to find it. And if I had to have a few of the local vintages along the way, that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. This is a venerable institution in Russia's wine industry. The Mishaka vineyard has been running almost continuously for nearly 150 years. And Chief Agriculturist Sergei here is in charge of making sure it's still one of the country's top tipples. Rash, Sergei. Hello, Sergei. Nice to meet you. Can you tell us all about your vineyard, please? Well, this is one of the first places in the Kuban region, and in Russia as a whole, after the Crimea, of course, where the first vineyards were set up. The Mishaka vineyards enjoy an almost Mediterranean climate, protected by mountains close to the sea and with warm winds that blow in from the steppe to keep the temperature balanced. It's been a recipe for great grapes for over 150 years and some of the workers have seen quite a few vintages come and go. Evgenia, how long have you worked here? I've been working here since 1955, when I first came to the vineyard. And I still work here. I really like this job, so I've never worked in any other place. I began after finishing seventh grade. I got married here too. This is definitely a job that inspires loyalty. Grandma Zhenia isn't the only person who returns for the harvest year after year, but there's always room for new workers. Let's start with this one. Okay. Listen, James, you have to pay attention to the following. Don't cut small branches like this one. We don't need the small ones, just the big ones. Yeah, don't touch these little ones. Otherwise, the wine will be poor quality. Carefully does it. Grasp it with your hand and cut it off like that. But the grape picker's job doesn't end when his bucket is full. James, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the task of grape gatherer involves not just gathering, but you also have to put the grapes into this container very carefully and sort through them. See, there's a leaf there. OK. They have to be taken out. Each of these crates weighs between 250 and 300 kilos, so getting them to the factory takes some good teamwork. So now we've got our massive tub full of grapes. Time to load it up and take it to the factory. Look at out of the way here. That's what you call a bit of coordination. Right, let's make some wine. So this is the second stage. Now that we've got the grapes here to the factory, these forklifts take them over there and unceremoniously dump them into the cellar so that they can be processed.
This is a lot more than just rows of dusty bottles. It's actually the best stuff in the winery, the grand reserve that's been sitting here for at least a year to develop its flavor. Much of which it gets from these, these wonderful, huge, heavy oak barrels, which give all the different notes and flavors to the wine. And apparently, if you press your ear to here long enough, you get to hear the occasional it's alive. We met where grapes were ripening. Your kiss was sweet like red wine. Now we're making our own vintage. I hope it and our love will last forever. Most wine companies in the Krasnodar region might be trying to up production, but there are some that still think that small is beautiful. I'm off to meet the king of Russia's so-called garage wines, and I've heard that this is some pretty high-level homebrew. Gennady Oparin is the man behind Usadba Semigoria. He used to be an importer and exporter of wines, and he's visited vineyards all over the world. But seeing other people cultivate their own brands wasn't enough. He wanted his own. In 2005, we bought a plot of land, and in 2006, planted the first grapevines, which brought their first harvest in 2009. In 2010, we took second place at the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc wine competition. The industry developed rapidly. The wine was in high demand among our guests, and we doubled the size of the harvest. Our vineyards are 14 hectares in area, and we mostly grow Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc, and a little Merlot. Vitaly, how many containers are there? Three. Take another three and be done with it. Okay. The boat's coming and we'll start processing. Okay. In garage wine, quality is everything, and Gennady has to micromanage the process. Everything is handmade from beginning to end. Strictly, this is a home brew. But can anyone actually do it? Well, if you've got the right fruit, anything's possible. And these plastic bins are where my beautiful grapes end up. But this is where the fermentation process takes place. As you can see, it's all completely low tech. But the grapes sit here for several weeks. And all you do, really, is come along and give them a good stir four or five times a day. So once the grapes become rather bitter, it's a sign that they're ready to be pressed. So now that that's happened, we can get the first press of the wine going in here. Probably it's best not to wear white when doing this, to be honest. It's completely traditional method. So our beautiful juice here goes through this hose and into, hopefully, get to it in time, this great big steel container. And it sits here for about three weeks until it's ready for the next stage of the process. Now, the right barrel is all important in the winemaking process because if you have good quality oak, it lets the wine breathe and imparts all sorts of interesting notes. So, our new batch is going to sit in here for eight months and hopefully it'll turn out to be rather delicious. Oh. That's it. A fermentation of red wine, which we've already processed and mixed, is about to finish. It's been fermenting for a whole two weeks now. 
And then we're going to fill these barrels with the very first batch. So after the wine's been sitting in its barrel for several months, comes the great decision. Is it ready to be bottled? And this is all down to the winemaker's personal choice. So let's see. Well, I reckon that's pretty good. We don't filter our wine. We bottle it directly from the barrels. Careful, careful, or the bottle will break. And put your foot here to keep it in place. Yes, that's right. The James Brown Vintage 2013. It's going to be invaluable in a few years, that. Who knows? Maybe this vintage will be another international award winner to add to his collection. But one thing's for sure, there's no Brown family bottle in his cellar. I was going to have to keep looking. Uh, my first uh, impression here, when I came in Krasnodar uh, airport, my first question, uh, <laughs> what, uh, what are you doing here? Russian wine has been enjoying a resurgence in recent years, thanks in no small part to European technology. But it's not only machines that are being imported from the continent. Born in the heart of France's wine country, Jean-Philippe has a lifetime of experience in the business. After projects all around the world, he's made his way east to Russia, although he's found a winery with a familiar name. He's in charge of the Chateau Le Grand Vostok, a brand which boasts its grapes are the equal of any in Bordeaux, and Jean-Philippe is gearing up for his first harvest. Uh, for, for me, the Russian, it's a, a little dream uh, because my uh, grandfather, mother's side, uh, was born in, uh, in Ukraine. And when I was um, a young people, every time I uh, hear uh, Russian, 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 and uh, after a long travel uh, in uh, Austri Austria, New Zealand, and the United States, I decided, uh, I decided uh, work in Russia. And uh, the last uh, June, I had a proposition for Russia, and uh, in one week, uh, I accepted uh, this uh, job. It's a simple story. But heavy rain and strong winds are causing significant problems. With the harvest already behind schedule, Jean-Philippe has to make sure the process runs smoothly. The weather hasn't been kind, and he needs to check the quality of the grapes that are coming in and exactly how long it's going to take. The longer the fruit stays on the vine, the riper it becomes, which can significantly affect the taste. Judging the moment of perfect ripeness is one of the most crucial decisions in winemaking. Riviette. Tell us, please, when are you going to finish if it doesn't start raining? In two hours. In two hours. And then let's call it a day. Two hours. And then let's call it a day. And then let's call it a day. By the way, you've never heard of the, the Brown family winery in this region, have you at all? No. What, what, what is this? Uh, oh, I like the stick. Yeah. <laughs> <It's real. sighs> I'm never going to find it. Wow. 
Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> we receive the grapes yes. here. <laughs> you see? <laughs> this is my last white grapes variety, mm. Aligoté. Let's go and see. Okay, okay, go. The grapes arrive here mm -hmm. in the distiller. Yep. Start. Green, Press the green. green button. The green. This separate in this side of the steam. And here, juice and berries just in the big pump and in hose, direct in the press. Okay. When the press is full, we start pressing and we take the juice with this pump and we stock the juice in the tank. 12, 12 hours okay. for uh, sedimentation. I test uh, one, two, three times, and when uh, I am happy, we make um, soutirage in France, and we uh, keep the wine in another tank. Now, an example, this tank, the fermenting, it's not real finish, but right. if you want to uh, test, this is my first tank, Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Don't you want? Yes, please. Uh, just a little bit sugar. Uh -huh. So this should be very sweet. Huh? Yeah, yes, yes. A uh -huh. so, um, so this is a. Um, this is after how how much time? Uh, 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 for the moment, uh, 18, uh, 18 days. 18 stay, days. And oh. I think finish next week, mm -hmm. after 20, uh, total 20, 22 days. So this is where it all ends up. What? The bottling line. Cuvée mm Kersoff, -hmm. the, uh, the best wine here with uh, Chen Royale. This, uh, it's a blend uh, Cabernet, Merlot, and Krasno Stop. Donc, uh, the, we are near uh, a Bordeaux blend. Bordeaux yeah. blend, a typical Bordeaux blend, Merlot and Cabernet. But we have a good uh, Russian variety, a Krasno Stop. We mix with this variety. So I can and see why, uh, why this would appeal to you. Well, <laughs> and uh, it's a Bordeaux blend, but with a Russian spirit. Sure. <laughs> Fate, like the horizon, has separated us from each other. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. All I have is this last bottle we made that summer. I will keep it until you return. I've decided I've been thinking too modern in my attempts to find my bottle's twin, so we're going to take a trip back in time. This is supposed to be home to one of the largest collections of Soviet wine in the region. Maybe I'll have a bit of better luck here. It seems that wine was popular, if expensive, throughout the Soviet Union. By the 1970s, this factory alone was producing more than two million bottles a year. This isn't just the oldest wine cellar in the region, it's also one of the largest. Each one of these tunnels is the length of almost three football fields. And, if you were so inclined, you could drink a litre of wine a day from each of these barrels, and it would take you 47 years to finish it. That'd be some hangover. This wine cellar contains 82,000 bottles of about 256 of the best sorts of wines from all winemaking regions of the former Soviet Union. Here we have wines from Georgia, Moldova and Russia, namely from Kuban, Don and the Stavropol region. But could I find a brown family bottle tucked away in this collection? Even in all these thousands, I still wasn't having any success. My personal quest wasn't going all that well, but I was getting a crash course in the history of wine in this region. Greek settlers brought the technology to the Black Sea coast more than 2,000 years ago, and one of their descendants is still following the traditions to this day. Hi, Yanis. 
Tell us about your technology, please. Difficult, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's fine. That's how we would crush bunches of grapes until recently. It hasn't been long since electric-powered wine presses appeared. After the revolution of 1917, people became obsessed with globalization and production growth. And drinking culture fell victim to the changes. Controlling the harvest rate is important. We do it as well. You have to set limits to the output volume. If you're expanding it more and more, it's easy to lose control. Then you'll have to use preservation agents and conservatives. To put it simply, it's murder. They kill wine. We take specially selected grapes. No rotten ones. But we don't throw away grapes of lower quality. We use them to make baths of wine and yeast. Well, I might not have found the second bottle, but there have been plenty of unexpected benefits for my trip to the Greek Stretto Vineyard. Ah, excuse me a moment. Winemaking is a very personal business. Everyone has different aims, different tastes, and a different clientele they're trying to reach. Choosing the correct moment to bottle can be the difference between success and failure, and that often comes down to one man's opinion. Getting it right, it seems, is never a perfect science. So we've been asking the great eternal question, I guess, to all our winemakers. What do you think the secret is to a perfect wine? Sorry, James, it's, <laughs> it's my secret. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> The more important for make a wine, a good wine, uh, make a good grapes. For, for me, a good winemaker, it's a real good uh, vineyard manager. It's uh, the secret. After, if you have a real good grapes in, in the cellar, you can make the good wine. But if you don't have this condition, it's impossible. You have to care for your vineyard. Grapes should be wholesome and ripe. Luckily, the climate here is favorable. You should control the fermentation process, clean the cellar, and store and serve bottles properly. That's my secret. There's nothing special about it. Gennady, have you heard the surname Brown in this region at all? I'm looking for a second bottle. I can answer your question. Well, if you search hard enough, you never know what you might find. Hello there. It seems we will never meet again in this life. Wine has never tasted the same to me since. Our bottle still sits in my cellar. Perhaps one day, it will find its way home. For the wine country browns, 